Welcome back to Nuances Are Asian Stories, a podcast where guests from a wide range of Asian ethnic groups, careers, countries, and communities join me to explore our often complicated relationships with our cultures and how they shape us. I'm your host, Azu, a new American who grew up in the only place the dodo bird ever lived, Mauritius. If you have a uterus or care about someone who does, you may want to stick around for this episode, which will cover very important women's health topics that aren't talked about enough, such as perimenopause, menopause, why a different birth control method might be better for you, or a different brand, and the fact that periods are optional. Today is Mother's Day in North America. If for whatever reason, Mother's Day is a difficult time for you, maybe you recently lost your mother or lost a child or have been trying to have a child or been estranged from your mother or child, I just want to acknowledge that you are seen and I hope you stay far, far away from the insensitive comments and unwelcome wishes today. To all the moms, moms-to-be and grandmas, happy Mother's Day. I want to wish a special Happy Mother's Day to all the moms who have been interviewed on this podcast, including career radio DJ Mimi Chen, who juggled between the world of rock and roll and mom duty in season three, episode one, the hilarious Ivy Lee, mom of two, who discovered her love for podcasts while breastfeeding and her knack for comedy writing while trying to re-enter the workforce, season three, episode 12. Dr. Sachi Schmidt-Hori talked about the differences in American versus Japanese parenting style in Season 4, Episode 6. Samantha Ong, mom of two girls, who left wedding photography and creates culturally accurate Asian dolls, Season 3, Episode 13. Oslin, who's a single mom and carves out time at night to create her music while raising her two adorable boys, Season 1, Episode 5. Tiffany Chow, who talked about becoming the primary caregiver for her brother Chris, who has autism. She is now a mom as well. Tiffany founded the company Depot Market, a jewelry store in Maui, which employs disabled employees. That's Season 2, Episode 3. And of course, we can't forget Cece, who was our featured guest on the Trans Day of Visibility episode, Season 4, Episode 7. And to all the people who are celebrating their moms today, let's remember that it's not enough to just celebrate moms once a year. We need to support moms during and after their pregnancy and in their everyday lives. It is worth noting that while in Canada, mothers can have access to about a year of paid maternity leave, earning between 50 to 80% of their insurable salary. And in Mexico, mothers are entitled to 12 weeks of paid leave at 100% of their salary. In the US here, the Family and Medical Leave Act only requires companies of at least 50 employees to give new moms unpaid leave of 12 weeks. Some states have programs that do offer paid leave, and certainly many companies have their own policies offering paid leave, but it is not mandatory according to any federal law. So yeah, we are behind on that. Maternal mortality rate is still relatively high. 700 mothers die every year as a result of pregnancy or its complications. Maternal mortality is two to three times more likely for Black, Alaska Native, and Native American mothers than for White and Asian mothers. So while we in the Asian diaspora are doing better on that front, we also need to show solidarity with our Black and Native mothers. It's also worth noting that teen moms are at higher risk of complications and death, which is why the stuff we're going to talk about today in this episode is important information for your daughters to have access to. Once the baby is born, moms are still getting the short end of the stick. A 2022 Pew Research study shows that moms are more likely to report taking on more of the childcare duties, while dads are more likely to report that it's an even 50-50 split. The moms are probably right though, because in 2021, American Time Use Survey shows that moms spend more time with their children than dads, especially when the kids are young. Now, I am not a mother myself, and I have no desire to be. If you're a non-mom like me, I see you, this episode will still have a lot of valuable information for you as well. So without further ado, let's get into our conversation with our guest. Dr. Sophia Yen is the co-founder of Pandia Health, which provides expert online women's hormonal health care from birth control to menopause and more. Dr. Yen graduated from MIT, UCSF Medical School, and UC Berkeley with a master's of public health. She's an MD as well. She has 20 plus years of experience in medicine. She's also a clinical associate professor at Stanford Medical School in adolescent medicine. Her passion is making women's lives better. She's also a mom of two future sheroes and a wife of a feminist. She's Taiwanese American. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Sophia Yen. First, I want to ask you, where did you grow up 
And what was that like as an Asian American? So I was born in Chicago, shipped off to Taiwan for my aunt to raise me for a couple of years. And then my aunt told my mom, we love Sophia. Why don't you just let us keep her? And my mom was like, no. So then she quickly picked me up. And then we went to Berkeley for my dad's postdoc, um, Milpitas for a bit, down to Orange County, then back to Silicon Valley and have been in Silicon Valley since about fourth grade, but was like in Milpitas for first and second grade, but have been in, in Silicon Valley since fourth grade. And then went to MIT for college, went back to UCSF and was in, have been in the Bay Area ever since. Um, growing up in the Bay Area, there were a lot of Asian Americans. And so I hear a lot of stories from other friends that are from Virginia or Kansas or Texas or Ohio. We definitely had our group of Asian Americans, but um, certainly amongst the Asian Americans, we would have like one Vietnamese, one Taiwanese, one Cantonese, you know, one Japanese not more than three to five of each ethnic subgroup. Yeah, but it didn't feel like you were an outsider. You Not at all, yeah. not at all. Yeah, the first time I felt as an outsider is when I was interviewing for residency. And back in the day, UC San Diego was very non-Asian. And so when I got off at the airport for the residency interview, I was like, this is not what I'm used to. And, <laughs> and I was like, the way you know you're not at a real Chinese restaurant, because of course being, you know, of Chinese descent, went immediately to the Chinese restaurant, P.F. Chang's. And <laughs> they had a piano player, the rice came by the bowl, the tea came by the cup, they sold wine, there was a fork at every table. I just made a list of like 10 ways you know you're not at a real Chinese restaurant. <laughs> That's funny. I've never been to a P.F. Chang, but I remember I went to a Panda Express one time in Nashville, and I was like, this isn't Chinese food. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Panda Express was, you know, founded in L.A. by people that are Chinese, so it's legit. But P.F. Chang's, if you don't know the story, it's Paul Fleming, white dude who did Steakhouse and just threw the thing Chang at the end. And so it is in what? no way legit. Wow. Yeah. I, I didn't know that. You know, as you said, you've been part of a lot of different groups of people in the Bay Area. And the term Asian American... People have very strong feelings about it. Some people love it. Some people hate it. I think you have some thoughts to share about that. So let's get into it. I have it. lots of opinions. It's a love-hate. I would say the love is all of us coming together to seek greater power. Like I'm always like, well, black people and people of Latina descent and Caucasians have this power. Let's achieve the same power. People of Jewish descent but as being a person of Asian descent, you know that amongst the different Asian subsectors, there are battles and conflicts and even Taiwanese versus Chinese, mainlander versus nationalist versus Democratic Party in Taiwan. Like if you haven't seen, what is that movie? The Grinch, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. There's like a battle scene featuring the Taiwanese government beating each other up. So even a amongst Taiwanese, there's like battle. And then there's the people who are expats. There are people who are here. There are people in Taiwan that is, a, you know, born in the USA, but parents are very strongly vested in Taiwan. I'm like, it's Taiwan. Let their people decide. Who are we to be US Americans interfering with what they're doing? But I get it. You were born there. It's your country. You have a lot invested in it. But I'm also American. And I hate it when people are like, where are you from? And I'm like, California? No, where are you really from? I was born in Chicago. No, where are you really from? My parents are from Taiwan. Is that what you're looking for? Because, you know, and I think for purposes of research, we need to separate the Asian because we're seeing health wise different consequences. And the example I give is HDL. That's the good cholesterol. You want as high as number as possible. And those of Japanese descent have a crazy high HDL. So I would love for my children to marry somebody of Japanese descent or in the future to 
splice in some CRISPR just so we can get that HDL. And then if you're of South Asian descent, you have low HDL, you have a greater risk of heart attacks. And if you put all of us together in one glob, then the high may balance out the low and then it may average, you know, different. And then also our food. Asian food and AAPI food is even greater difference, right? There's the deep fried lumpia and then there is, you know, spring rolls and deep fried rolls and then there's naan and then there's curry, but then there's Japanese curry or South Asian curry. So just like on your food, because I'm also an obesity expert, that's going to affect your risk of heart attack. That's going to affect your risk of obesity. So for power and politics, let's come together. But for research, let's separate out. And probably the future is genetics because I like to make fun of my brother, Kelvin, because he has little brown hairs in his chin. And we're like, ha ha, that's the Portuguese in you because the Portuguese took over Taiwan at some point. So, you know, bottom line, it comes down to your genetics. But it's obvious that different Asian subgroups have different genetics that respond differently to drugs. Yeah. That's so interesting. I didn't know that Japanese had the high HDL. That's pretty cool to have. Yes, yes. No, I have a Taiwanese friend and she has high HDL and she has some Japanese relatives in her lineage. And I'm like, oh, I would love to have a baseline HDL of 60 to 80. Like, that would be awesome. Because the only way to get it up there is to exercise like crazy. And I am a couch potato. So am I. <laughs> What made you decide to become a doctor? As you know, all Asian Americans, your options are doctor, programmer, and maybe entrepreneur now, or maybe lawyer, you know, only jobs that make money and that are very dependable. No artists, no music, no acting, though we have seen great success with Crazy Rich Asians. But, you know, that is the one in a million versus the 80% will do fine if you choose that profession. But I chose medicine because I love science and I love people. And my brother chose the PhD route because he loves science, but I guess he didn't like people as much or <laughs> that he could contribute better to the world doing research. Whereas I really love people. Each person has their own story to tell. And I love the idea of making a difference in someone's life by giving them information to improve their health. And my mom was a nurse. And she said, don't be a nurse, be a doctor, because the nurses do all the scut work and the doctors get all the credit. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm into that. I want the credit. <laughs> <And> so that's <laughs> why I became a physician. And how did you decide on women's health and reproductive health? Yeah. So as a pre-med in high school, I was sexually active and I was like, I cannot get pregnant during high school, college, medical school, residency, fellowship. And as a <laughs> as an underage person, I'm like, I, I deserve the right to comprehensive sex ed, confidential reproductive health care. If anything happens, I better get to decide what happens in my body. And I don't if I'm old enough to have sex and I'm old enough to decide what happens to my body. If I'm old enough to be a parent, I'm old enough to decide what happens to my body. And so that really got me into reproductive rights, reproductive health. Also, as a pre-med, it worked really well. I would go around and give contraceptive roadshows at any organization that MIT wanted me to speak at. So a dormitory, a fraternity, a sorority, a club, a pre-med group, anybody that wants to learn about birth control, I would go in front of. And it was great for my resume. And then as I went through medical school, I was like, well, do I want to do ob -GYN or do I want to do something else? And ob -GYN seemed obvious given my passion, but I wasn't so great at anatomy, not so great at surgery. And then I found adolescent medicine where I could do outpatient gynecology without having to do the surgery, without having to deliver the babies. And I was like, yes. I can talk about birth control. I can catch young people as they start to have sex, give them the good habits. You can have sex, just don't get pregnant and don't get any diseases, you know? So uh, that's how I chose where I went. That's awesome. In your experience, I'm wondering if you see any discrepancies that seem cultural when it comes to education about reproductive health and women's health in general. Yes, one thing that came up to me as a feminist is tampon use. So race and ethnic disparities in tampon use. In my teen clinic, when you ask, do you use tampons or pads, how many, how often? Oftentimes I would say less than 
1% of Asians, Blacks, and Latinas use tampons. And like 60 to wow. 80% of Caucasians use tampons. And they'd be like, oh, that's a racial ethnic thing. Don't touch that. Don't mess with their culture. And I was like, there's nothing in the book of Asian, Black, or Latino that says you cannot use a tampon. It's simply education that my mom had pads. My grandma had pads. I was given pads. Pads work fine. Why would I try anything different? But when I talk to the young people in my clinic or any woman that has not tried tampons, I'm like, have you tried tampons? It's like night and day. But I also pull on the immigrant thing, which is like we came to America to be on par with the Caucasians. And if 80 percent of Caucasians are using tampons, then 80 percent of us should be using tampons like pads is a old, old technology. Tampons is new. And I don't know if this is still the case, but last time I Googled it, there's only one manufacturer of tampons in all of China. And back, you know, about five to 10 years ago, if you wanted tampons, you had to import them or you had to go to the expat store. You couldn't just go down to the corner store and get some tampons. They had some seriously high tech pads that like smelled like peppermint and made your vagina swoosh, but like they did not have any tampons. And so um, anybody who's anti-tampon, I, I propose to you, if your young person was bleeding blood out of their nose like crazy, you wouldn't be like, oh, you can't put a tampon in there. You're going to violate the sanctity of her nair. No. And that's the same thing with, with tampons, is you're not going to violate the sanctity of her hymen. The hymen is not a cribiform plate. The hymen is just around and you can slip it in. It should be fine. But there are also other things that can break the hymen, such as, you know, riding on a horse or a bicycle or doing the splits or doing some karate kick. Who knows and who cares? Right. Like for me, I pitch it again as a quality as well as better life. And I also I pitch it as cleanliness. Is it better to stop the blood where it originates or let it ooze out and smear here, smear there? And my pet peeve is, you know, underpants, clothing, bed, sheets, like all sorts of horror and just like just horror, blood everywhere. I agree. Yeah. I would even say, since a couple of years ago, I've switched from tampons to oh, cups. Next level. And that's even, that's even yeah, better. It's better for the environment and next level. Um, Absolutely. I'm just trying to get people to tampons. Yeah. And once we get to tampons, then we go to cups. Or we can go straight to cups, just not pads. Because to me, pads is like, again, messy. And also the smell and the chafage, you know. It's uncomfortable. Yeah. It, once you, once yeah. you tried the other, you don't go. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> so other than the pads and tampons thing, are there any misconceptions that you're seeing often in patients in terms of reproductive health or any anything related to what you're doing? Yeah. No, I would say let's go over the top myths in birth control. So the number one myth is that if you use hormonal birth control or even the copper IUD, that it will make you sterile. And my joke is, it's going to make you infertile while you're on it. That's why you're taking it, right? But the question is, I think, when you come off of it, does it affect your long-term fertility? And the research shows that once you come off of these medications, the pill, the patch, the ring, the implant, any of the IUDs, the shots, all of those except for the shot are out of your body by two weeks. And the way you know this is I'm gonna show a little thing here that has the birth control pill pack. There's three weeks of active pills, one week of sugar pills. And when you get to the second or third day of your sugar pill, you bleed. And that's because the hormone has washed out of your body. So a week, and if you wanna be really anal, I'll throw in an extra week, by two weeks, it is out of your body. So it has no long-term effect on your body. Same thing goes for the implant, same thing goes for the IUD. All of that is out of your body in two weeks. And so it has no effect on your long-term fertility. The shot, I made an exception because it is shot and it sits in your muscle. And so sometimes it takes eight months for it to wash out completely from your body. But on average, 80% of people will get pregnant in a year in attempting to get pregnant. But with the shot, it may take you an extra eight months to completely wash that out 
and get pregnant. And the reason for this perception is if you take 100 women on the pill, patch, ring, IUD, implant, and you have 100 women not on a birth control method, wait 20 years, right? Because they're holding off on having babies during that time. And then take everybody off and say, hey, you all get pregnant. 10% of each group will develop polycystic ovarian syndrome. And women with PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, have a hard time getting pregnant because they don't pop out an egg every single month. And if you don't pop an egg, you can't get pregnant. And so 10% of those women who had never been on birth control will have a hard time getting pregnant. And 10% of the women that were on the pill, patch, ring, IUD, implant, will have a hard time getting pregnant. And people are like, oh, it was the birth control. But no, it's the same in both groups. It's the polycystic ovarian syndrome. And then one more thing to hammer that in, I was giving a talk to a bunch of infertility specialists and I'm like, why am I giving a talk about birth control pills to infertility specialists? And they're like, we use the birth control pill to normalize the hormones in people with polycystic ovarian syndrome. And then when they come off, that's the best time for them to get pregnant. That's the most normal that their hormones are going to be. Because when PCOS people are not on birth control, their hormones get weird and weirder and weirder and weirder and weirder. And then it's harder to get pregnant. But by putting them on birth control pills, it flattens things, normalizes things. And when they come off, they bleed because the hormones drop and they bleed and then they build back up and two weeks out, ready to go. That is the most fertile that PCOS person is gonna be. So again, birth control does not make you infertile once you come off of it. It makes you infertile while you're on it and that's why you're using it. And birth control pills, patch, ring, are actually used by infertility specialists to prep your body to become fertile. Yeah, I'm wondering if you have any stats for the Asian American group, for example, percentage wise, how many of the women in the fertile group are on some sort of birth control or not? Yes. So about, I think, 92 to 95 percent of sexually active people will use some form of birth control in their lives. And this includes Catholics. It's <laughs> just so you know. I think it also depends where, I mean, if you're in the Philippines where it's illegal and it's harder to get your hands on it, but if you're an Asian American, that 92 to 95 percent will be on some form of birth control in your life. So it's highly prevalent, highly likely. And then I also want to emphasize the non-contraceptive benefits of the birth control pill patch ring. And for me, hashtag periods optional. You don't have to bleed every month. You could bleed every three months, every six months, or never. Also, acne. I used to get one giant zit once a month. I called it the North Star, the commercial that made it totally hit home as a teenager when I saw that. I was like, yes, me, North Star, once a month. And I forget if it was before my period, after my period, whatever. But once I went on the pill, that decreases your circulating testosterone and decreases the zit. And once I stopped that up and down, up and down, up and down every month without hormones and going on hormones, it was smooth. I did not get the zits. And then if you have polycystic ovarian syndrome, endometriosis, bad evil periods, as I like to say, heavy periods, painful periods, anemia, the number one cause of anemia in a menstruating woman is menstruation. So these are all the benefits of being on the pill patch ring that have nothing to do with preventing pregnancy and everything to do with just quality of life. Yeah. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about that. You had a TEDx talk about making periods optional. Why am I only hearing about this now? <laughs> and are there any risks or side effects? Thank you so much for saying what I just want to shout out from the rooftops to everyone. My gift to this world upon my deathbed is I shared with as many people as I could with the uterus that you do not need to bleed every single month. If you ask your uterine bearing doctor if they're bleeding every month, the likelihood is very low. Did they share this with you? Not so much because doctors are afraid. They want to have enough data. They don't want to get sued in the United States and stuff like that. But are they personally doing it? Yes, they are. And it's become more acceptable recently because more people are using the IUD. And with the hormonal IUD, 30% of people have no bleeds whatsoever. And then 70% is lighter. So the hormonal IUD is actually used as a treatment for heavy, painful periods. Same thing with the implant. And then with the shot, after three shots, about 75% of people have no periods. Again, yay! 
and then the other 25% will have lighter or irregular periods. And then we're realizing as we learn more history that the maker of the pill only had this one week off to bleed because he was like, oh, I don't think women can handle it if we took away their periods. And I was like, how about you ask? Ask, you know, like, I would like to not have my period. I would like to have it every three months, six months, or never. And in fact, I haven't had it for the past 14 years because I realized as a doctor, the only reason those of us with a uterus bleed every month is we build that lining and we're like, embryo, oh, no embryo, bleed. And then we build it up again. Embryo, oh, no embryo, bleed. And if we're not trying to catch an embryo, from age 12 to 26 on average in the United States, or for those of us who had to get through more education, 34, and then pop out two kids, and then no babies until 50, why are we going up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down every single month? And we actually have 350 to 400 periods in our lives, which is three times normal. Normal would be 100 periods in our lives, because back in the day, we would have eight babies. How many periods do you have when you're pregnant with eight babies? Zero. How many periods do you have when you're breastfeeding exclusively every two to three hours? Zero. And so that's why back in the day we only had 100 periods and now we're having 350 to 400. I don't want to bleed enough for three other women. That's not okay. And so we can achieve that with the pill, the patch, the ring, the IUD, the implant, and every time you build up that lining, it can mutate and turn into endometrial cancer. Every time you pop out an egg, and we don't know if it's the popping, the healing, or the tubes, we think it has something to do with the tubes, um, you risk ovarian cancer. If you ask any educated physician, how do I decrease my risk of ovarian cancer? There's only two ways. One, take out the ovaries, which we do not recommend unless you're post-menopause and there's no purpose and you might as well just take them out or going on the birth control pill, patch or ring for five years will decrease your risk of ovarian cancer by 50% because it stops that ovulation for five years and decreases your risk of ovarian cancer. And it also decreases your risk of colorectal cancer. And that allows me to bring up that your colon is around your uterus and your uterus is like up and down, up and down, up and down every month. And your colon and rectum's like, oh, I'm sad for you. I'm gonna run faster and then you get diarrhea, I'm gonna run slower, and you get constipation. And 30% of those of us who bleed every month have one of those. And so not only do you have blood coming out, now you got poo, it's like insult to injury, and then a zit. I'm like, this is just horrifying. If you're not trying to make a baby, why are we suffering this indignity, this blood loss? And if you're cold, tired, pale, make sure you get checked for anemia and iron deficiency. Yeah. When you said if you go on the pill for five years, that decreases your chance by 50%. Is that taking the pill without the sugar pills at all, like just skipping the period altogether or doesn't matter? It doesn't matter because the pill in general, the main way it works is blocking ovulation. But if you skip the bleed, that will decrease your risk of the lining cancer. Because again, every time you slough that lining and you build it, you increase your risk of cancer because it can mutate. The more times you turn it over, the worse it is. And I think that also affects colon cancer too, because the colon is only affected by the hormones going up and down, but also the when it goes down, then that's a a drastic kind of change and actually uh, you know an extra caveat is this last seven days of pills was fine when the birth control pill was at 110 micrograms of estrogen and now it's at 30 or 20 and so they're actually seeing escape ovulation on day five six seven and so you'll see the new pills only have four days of sugar pill so in general i would recommend cutting your sugar pills down to four and i would recommend none at all because why risk a bleed at all one thing i wanted to ask was i know some people who have had that side effect with birth control pills where they have blood clots blood clots yeah. so how prevalent is that and is that something that we should be worried about if we're going to take the pill indefinitely so we don't bleed? Yes. So the risk of blood clots goes up with age. And so if you're a 35 and a smoker, then we do not recommend an estrogen containing birth control pill. The risk of blood clots on a progesterone only method, such as the shot, the IUD, the implant, 
all of those, the risk is very, very low. And with the copper IUD, there's no hormones at all. But I'm not a fan of the copper IUD because more blood, more cramps. But if you're the kind of woman who's like, oh, is that blood running down my leg? You, you're a great candidate for the copper IUD. But if you're like me, I feel every blood coming down my vagina and like coming out. No, no, you are not a candidate for IUD. But back to the blood clots. If there is a family history of blood clot, if you have a blood clotting disorder, anecdotally, my Taiwanese family, we're the opposite. We actually bleed like stink. And so we don't have a known blood disorder, but we notice when we get a cut, it like takes a while for it to stop bleeding. And when my dad had his quintuple bypass, the doctor was like, he was a little bit oozy. And I was like, oh yeah, that runs in our family. And he's like, why didn't you tell me? And I was like, why didn't you <laughs> test for it? You know, like, but I did get a test for it. And, and the, the, the test that they have for it is really barbaric. It's called the bleeding time. And all they do is take a razor, slice your arm, and time how long it takes for you to stop bleeding. I was like, that's not cool. And now I have a little slice scar on my arm. So like not worth it. So I do think that's a brilliant question. And I definitely don't know, but I'd be curious if anyone has done that research that do bleeding disorders vary by race. And I think absolutely, because we hear certain races and because of our genetics have different diseases, such as again, Asian Americans have thalassemia, which prevents malaria, but causes small blood cells. My entire life growing up, I was traumatized by my physician because they were like, you have anemia, you need to take iron. I was like, okay, I'm taking my iron. I'm taking it every day and I'm taking it with orange juice and I'm taking it with beef jerky to increase the absorption. And like, you're not taking it. I'm like, I swear I'm taking it. And then I go to medical school and we learn about thalassemia. And I was like, wait, I think I have thalassemia. And I looked it up and I had thalassemia. So no matter how much iron I took, I was not going to get my blood cells up. Boo. So it's really important to know the difference by race, by genetics and prevalence of disease. And also just a random fact, the BMI cutoff is different for Asians than it is for Caucasians. You know, in general, we're a more petite society. And so the BMI cutoff of 25 for being overweight and 30 for obese is too high. And they actually see cardiac badness at lower BMI, which makes me sad because I love my desserts. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. So what would be the cutoff for? Yeah, I believe Asian it's women. two points lower. Oh, wow. So 23 and 28 would be our cutoff. Damn. Yeah. You know, it's funny you mentioned about your dad having the bypass because my dad also had a triple bypass and he also bled wow. a lot. And the surgeon said he noticed that the my dad is in Mauritius. So he said the Chinese Mauritians that he operates on tend to bleed more. Ah, so see, I think we have a bleeding disorder that they have not yet figured. It's not like hemophilia, which we all know happens when inbred Caucasians have, in, in the UK, if the kings, that's why they got it, right? Because they were all incestuous and whatnot, because they had to breed the royalty or whatever. And we know hemophilia is a Caucasian thing. But I'm pretty sure there's this ooziness. Yeah. And, and how come this? Because he's a surgeon. He's not a blood doctor. But if he were a blood doctor, he could study this. Or if we get Asian blood doctors to study this or Asian Americans to study this versus Caucasians, you know, the problem in doing the research is you have to get enough of the numbers. So whenever I do research, I like to break the Asians down by all the subcategories. I'm like Taiwanese and then Vietnamese and then Tongan. And then are you half Taiwanese, half Korean? You know, like all all this stuff. But then in the end, when I'm trying to do the analysis, I don't have enough numbers in each of the groups that have to glob them all together. And I was like, but they're different. Yeah, I think because in Mauritius, the m majority of the population is from India. Oh. It, so Indian or African descent. Okay. And Chinese people are about 2%. But it's a small island. And that's all the people you have. There's barely any white people there. Oh. Um, so he was able to notice that trend. Great. So Whereas in the U.S., I think you would see, you know, once in a while you would see an Asian, East Asian person. So yes. it makes sense that you wouldn't see it. So we have several birth control methods available. And you mentioned some that I had never really looked into before. So I'm wondering if you want to go through like best to worst Great methods. question. I call this Dr. Yen's what you need to know now that Roe is gone in the United States. So we're blessed to be in a crazy, awesome liberal state of California 
who has declared themselves a sanctuary for the rest of the country. But if you are not blessed to be in one of these liberal sanctuaries, New York and California, if you don't know, Arizona just went back to 1864. It's just so messed up. Anybody with a uterus is now being treated as if you were 1864, even before Arizona was a state. So for those in Arizona, Texas, Florida, Kansas, Alabama, all those states where your rights have been stripped away, very important for you to hashtag get your birth control under control. So um, one way to quiz your doctor to see if they're on the cutting edge of birth control is to ask them, what is the most effective birth control method? And this blows my mind. The implant, it's this little rod the size of a toothpick, the, the thickness of a toothpick, and it goes in your arm about uh, eight centimeters from your olecranon process. My daughter's now 14, but when she was 10, I was like, a 10 year old could learn how to put this in. So if you were to go to a third world country and you wanna do some service and just throw down a whole bunch of these implants in people, this is the most effective form of birth control and it beats vasectomy. Vasectomy is a permanent birth control and is the gold standard, but this hormonal thing that goes in your arm that lasts for three years and actually has the good hormone that I'll tell you about later, beats vasectomy. So first the implant, then vasectomy, then comes the hormonal IUD. And for those of you who can watch the video, I just want to show how small this is. Look how small, smaller than my thumb. This is a real IUD size shape. It's just not a real ID because it doesn't bend and it's purple to tell you do not stick this in anyone. But um, the normal one is white and bendy and goes in. And this beats tubal ligation. The fact that people can get pregnant on tubal ligation shows you how fertile the human body is. Tubal ligation is not just snip the tubes on each side of the uterus, as you can see my necklace here, but for those of you who can't, the, the tubes, they take out an inch, they burn it, and people still get pregnant. But this IUD with hormone beats tubal ligation, then comes tubal ligation, then comes the copper IUD, then comes the shot, which is every 12 weeks. The negative of the shot is it gives people munchies. And then if you're on the skinny side, it gives you bad bone density. But anything is better than pregnant because pregnancy will give you the munchies and it will take away your bone density. <laughs> and then comes the ring. What's cool is there's now a one year ring. You could just stick it up there and leave it for the entire year. Or you could take it out every three weeks, have a bleed for a week. I don't know why you would do that, but if it brings you joy to bleed, then yeah, go for it. And then there's the patch. And now that I'm on the estrogen replacement patch, I'm like, why is this patch so big? My estrogen replacement patch is like this small. This is huge. Why can't they make it smaller? But anyway, better the patch than nothing. And then the ring, the patch, oh, and then the pills. The key thing to know about the birth control pill is that there are 40 different birth control pills, eight different progesterones. If you don't like a particular pill, please note this is a progesterone and I don't like it because it gives me zits, it gives me munchies, it gives me irregular periods, blah, blah, blah. And then I realized as a woman of color and a physician, what I was being taught at the academic institutions were great. If you're a Caucasian female that wants to bleed every month, what we are teaching everyone to prescribe in all of the medical schools is great. If you're a Caucasian female that wants to bleed every month, but if you're of Asian or black descent or you don't want to bleed every month, I talked to my fellow Asian and black doctors and like, oh yeah, that drug that we're teaching everyone to write does not work for our people. And I tested it because I was like, oh yeah. I had to go through three different birth control pills until I found one that didn't have side effects. And so at Pandia Health, we have an algorithm that our doctor asks, what race are you as a proxy for genetics? What's your BMI? What's your bleeding preference? Do you wanna bleed every month, every three months, every six months? How old are you to make sure we give you enough estrogen for your bone density? And with that, we're able to make 82% of people happy at a year on their first birth control pill ever versus the standard of 30 to 50%. And our 100% doctor team has been trained on this. And I took all 40 birth control pills because I'm academic, went to MIT, UCSF, Stanford, couldn't just sit there and write birth control and watch people have side effects. I had to study it. 
and took all the birth control pills, ranked it from most likely make you bleed, least likely make you bleed. Most likely give you zits, least likely give you zits. Most likely give you munchies, least likely give you munchies. Took what we were telling everyone to prescribe, everybody across the nation, fixed it for the side effects we were seeing in people of Asian and black descent. And so much better treatment and putting it in the minds of physicians that the and they know we now know it's called pharmacogenetics that people with different liver enzymes metabolize drugs differently and so if you chew through the drug faster you're going to have more breakthrough bleeding if the drug stays around longer you're going to have more side effects if you have different response to androgen or you have more androgen which is testosterone the manly hormone that gives you zits and hairiness and munchies then it's going to be different so that's how I've improved experience for people by coming up with this proprietary algorithm that only my company has, Pandia Health. We're the only women-founded, women-led, doctor-founded, doctor-led, Taiwanese-American founded and led company in this space. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I didn't know that there were that many different brands and that they all had different types of side effects. That's, that's great to know. What are some things that you think people should consider when trying to decide what kind of birth control to go with? You know, a new paradigm was when we talk to patients, offer them the best and work our way down. Because in the old days, we'd start with condoms and we work our way up. And by the time I got to IUD or implant, you'd be like, eh, not paying attention, you know. And certainly I recommend a hormonal method or the copper IUD if you're that kind of person that can tolerate it plus condoms and I do that as a feminist so I actually have a condom bag and for those of you who are watching this <laughs> condom bag and people are like you're married why do you have a condom bag are you like cheating on your husband and I'm like no as a feminist I don't like to have my vaginal flora messed up by semen every single time I have sex I also don't like to leak secretions for 24 hours and if you had to leak secretions for 24 hours you would sure as heck make sure that I took my secretions with me and so I like condoms for prevention of pregnancy doubling up with a hormonal method and prevention of sexually transmitted infections. I'd like to touch on IUDs briefly. I've never had one, but I have some friends who have, and the pain sounds nightmarish. Should they have been offered pain management or is this the norm? Is that just how it works? Pain management for IUDs is gonna be like pain management for circumcision. And because not everyone's a pediatrician, I bet you didn't know that for the longest time they did not put any anesthesia for circumcision. Cause they're like, ah, it just takes a second slice and the baby just cries, wah, and then it's over. And so I was what? like, that's kind of like gross and barbaric. And certainly I'm not criticizing the Jewish culture, blah, 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 blah. They give the kid a little alcohol or whatever. But in the hospital with a doctor, we now numb it up before we slice it up. And so when I learned about IUD insertion and they were like, oh, well, we don't have the data. We don't know if numbing it up helps. And I was like, as a woman, I'd err on the side of numbing it up, whether or not you know, because like, like, err on the side of numbing it up. You know what I mean? There's no addiction to lidocaine in my cervix, you know? And some people are like, well, you know, the effort of sticking a needle in there, that's more painful than the thing itself. And I was like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I think you should numb it up. Research has been done showing that it does help. And then some people are like, well, I can't get my hand on it. It takes too much time. And I was like, so you're just gonna like cut someone open cause you don't have, you can't get your hands on it or you don't have that much time. Like, no, no, and no. So yes, um, absolutely demand a paracervical block. If they have any questions, there's a research paper out by, I think it's a group in San Diego. I was at a conference and we actually had the authors of the group come in. And it was really interesting because I had just been in a group in the morning and they're like, oh yeah, I never offer it. If they ask for it, I'll give it to them. And I said, isn't that a very privileged position? Because they have to have read the New York Times or had a friend that suffered through it in order to know to ask you like 
for equity, you should offer it to everyone. And then if they say no, then that's fine. But to only give it to those who know to ask, that is totally a privileged thing to do. And they're like, I can't get my hands on it. It's like, well, go get some, you know, <laughs> like certainly if there's none to be had, like right now there's a Wagovi shortage or when there were no COVID vaccines, then you could prioritize. But like, that's not an excuse. Go get some. And so there is a hurricane spray that you can spray and then do the injection. But I would ask for the paracervical block. My other tip to you is 30 minutes ahead of time, take 600 to 800 milligrams of ibuprofen, assuming you don't have an allergy, assuming that your kidneys are fine. Take it with food so you don't get an ulcer and scream at me later about it. But 800 milligrams of ibuprofen is equivalent to a milligram of morphine. So good for pain relief. And then the other tip, I know it's hard to do and it's not necessary, but if it were me, my daughter, my friend, I'd try. Try to schedule it on the last days of your period because the hole is already open and stuff is coming out. You don't want the first day because then if you put it in, it might come back out. But if you do the last days of your period as it's drying up, the hole's open and you go through. If you don't do it on your period, then the hole is closed with some cervical mucus and they just have to push through it. So it's not a big deal. It actually is not making a new hole in your body. The implant is making a new hole, just a little hole in your body. But the IUD does not make a new hole. It just has to push through the mucus plug. But it might be easier if it's already open to begin with. And certainly somebody who's had a baby before, it's going to be a lot easier. To That's great to know. Because when they told me about it, I'm like, that sounds awful. Yeah. No, do not suck it up. Totally advocate for yourself. Invoke Dr. Sophia Yen, Stanford, adolescent medicine, and say, I want the cervical block. There's a paper on it. It works. Don't do this to me. And then if you want to freak them out, because if pediatricians, they'll be like, this is going to be the circumcision of your time that you did not offer me pain relief for my IUD placement. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> they'll back off <laughs> or argue that would you do uh, circumcision without anesthesia that's a good point and i had no idea that they did that without anesthesia that's horrible yeah it was during my time i guess after 1997 they started testing sugar and they noticed if you give the kid a ton of sugar he cried less and then they're like how about we numb it up like duh yeah i'm gonna chop off your foreskin with no anesthesia Going back to BMI for a second, you mentioned in one of your posts that BMI affects how effective birth control is. Do you want to talk about that? Yes. So really important for people to know, I'm all about preventing unplanned pregnancy and I'm not paid by this company. I'm looking for my package right now somewhere here is the Ella emergency contraceptive. So it's, there are two pill emergency contraceptions. Aha. One is over the counter and it's plan B and it's generics. And then the other is prescription only. And the prescription only is Ella. I'm not paid by Ella. I'm just trying to prevent unplanned pregnancy. Ella works up to a body mass index of 35. Once your BMI is 35 or greater, your only option is the IUDs. But know that if I were sexually assaulted or my daughter were sexually assaulted and I wanted the lowest chance of being impregnated by my rapist, I would use the copper IUD. The copper IUD is 99.999% effective in preventing the egg and sperm from hooking up and a baby from happening from that if you get it within five days of contraceptive failure or sexual assault. This one works up to a BMI of 35, but plan B is generic, so the over-the-counter, a woman may be taking it and like, I'm preventing unplanned pregnancy. But if your BMI is 26, and 66% of the US population is a BMI of 26 or greater, BMI is 26 or greater doesn't work so well. BMI of 30 or greater does not work at all. So there's a whole bunch of wow. campuses that are putting these in vending machines. And I'm like, you need to put a sticker that says, check your BMI. If your BMI is 26, doesn't work so well. If your BMI is 30, does not work at all. Don't even waste your money or time on this, you know? And then know that you can wow. get this ahead of time. So at Pandia Health, when we write you for a birth control pill patch ring, we're like, you want some emergency contraception with that in case you forget taking your pill, in case you run out or whatever, in case your friend needs it or whatever. And we write on there, please give the patient the one with the farthest expiration date. Because usually you can get one that expires two years from now, 18 months from now. 
And thanks to the Affordable Care Act, if you have insurance, no copay, no deductible, free. You just got to get your doctor to write it and fill it. That's awesome. Yeah. So for people who want to work with Pandia, are you able to prescribe anywhere in the States? So we are licensed to prescribe in 16 states and we can deliver to all 50 states. So I started the company so that no one runs out of birth control in our watch. I actually coined the term pill anxiety, that if you get to that last week of pills and if you don't have pills, you start freaking out. <laughs> and that why should women have to suffer every month from age 15 to 50? I gotta get to the pharmacy, I gotta get to the pharmacy. If I don't get to the pharmacy, I'm gonna end up pregnant or bleeding or can't have sex when I wanna have sex. Like, forget that. We'll just ship it to you and keep shipping it to you. So we can deliver to all 50 states. If you have insurance and a prescription, you pay us nothing. Because thanks to the Affordable Care Act, no copay, no deductible. If you need to use one of our expert doctors who's been trained on this algorithm that I came up with and taught all of these physicians, um, then it's just $30 once a year to use our expert doctors. I made it with unlimited follow-up questions for a year about birth control. Nothing else because you only paid $30. And so 16 states. We purposely chose the biggest states because it costs the same amount of money to start up in Alaska as it does in California, Florida, Texas. So we did California, Florida, Texas, Nevada, Arizona. We did some swing states, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Ohio, Illinois, New York. The example I give is we're not in Connecticut or New Jersey because of licensing stuff, but we are in New York. So if you can get to one of these states and be like, I'm at SFO, I'm at LAX, I'm in Vegas for funsies, I'm in New York, JFK, on my way to Europe or whatever, and you fill it out and like, I'm here right now then legally our New York doctor can write that prescription, our Arizona and Nevada doctor can write that prescription, and then we can ship it to all 50 states. And you just gotta get back to one of those states in the next you know, year to renew it because legally we have to rewrite the prescription every year. That's great to know. Now, one more thing I want to talk about, you know, growing up in Mauritius, I'd never heard much about menopause. I knew it happened and that it was hell but didn't think there was anything much we could do about that. Yes. So do you want to talk a bit about perimenopause and menopause and what's available? Yes. Same thing in medicine. In 1997, when I graduated medical school, what we were taught is you put your hand on the woman's shoulder and you're like, menopause, suck it up. Sorry. <laughs> you know, like this will pass. It is what it is. Now we know that on average, hot flashes on average last seven years. Would you ask a dude to suck up anything for seven years? No. I, I think the maximum, you know, in my ADHD world that I'll tolerate something is a week, maybe three weeks, maybe a month, maybe three months, but seven years? Hell no. But women are just like, okay, I will. We're strong. We suck it up. It is what it is. No, no, and no. And somebody said something the other day that was brilliant. You will not get a medal for sucking it up for five years to see how long I could like hang out until I need the medication. The research has actually shown the sooner you start it, the better for your heart, for your bones, and for your brain. And so particularly people of Asian descent, we suck at our calcium right? A lot of us are lactose intolerant. None of us had milk built into our diet anywhere. Certainly Asian American maybe had more milk somewhere along the line, but I was not one of those people. And so we are at risk of osteopenia. There are four indications legally for hormone replacement therapy. And one of them is risk of osteopenia. So basically being Asian or being Latino or being black and lactose intolerant scores you that, which is awesome for once that we get something just for that. Um, the other ones are not so great because if you don't have hot flashes, if you don't have night sweats, if you don't have genital urinary symptoms, but I think you will notice because the way I kind of knew I hit menopause is what I call sandpaper V. It was like sandpaper down there, not pleasant. And then I had a family member, they had recurrent urinary tract infections at age 70. And I was like, what's that about? Like, you know, um, usually it's like 20 years old, you don't know to pee after sex, that's when you get that. And I was like, is that 70 year old having like wild crazy sex? <laughs> or it turns out <laughs> that in menopause, if you don't have enough estrogen and it affects your vagina or urethra that way, it goes 
and it gets all dried up. And if your vagina dries up, then your urethra dries up is right above it. And then you can have recurrent urinary tract infections. So yet another reason to go on hormone replacement therapy or hormone therapy. So there are a bunch of different companies that are, you know, treating menopause. My company is one of them, pandiahealth.com forward slash menopause. We're charging $130 for the first visit because it's with a physician. It's asynchronous, but you ask a whole bunch of questions and we have to review all the questions and then make sure it's safe to write you the drug. And then $60 per follow-up afterwards. But if you're doing great, you don't have to do the follow-up. And then the medications are covered by insurance, but the insurance are... Um, requiring a copay. So I'm working on an advocacy component. I'm hoping that Biden Harris will consider making menopause, no copay, no deductible, just like they did with birth control. And I'm calling that V2. So V1 was birth control. V2 should be menopause. And if you don't cover it, then you're sexist and ageist. So um, don't be afraid to talk about it. Talk about it with your parents, particularly Asian Americans, because we're at risk of osteopenia. Um, it also helps with dementia. My mom, unfortunately, my family has it in our family and I'm afraid of it. So definitely. And again, you want to get on it within 10 years of menopause, but the sooner the better. And I'm going to give you Dr. Yen's take on it which is I believe that age 52-ish, your body takes away your estrogen is like, thank you for your service, go die. And I'm like, well, they took away the estrogen, put it back, you know? Because when they take away the estrogen, your bones go to badness. When they take away your estrogen, our arteries turn into what I call man arteries. They become hard, they get filled with clots. And so that's why you don't want them to become hard and filled with clots and then throw estrogen on them. You want them to take away the estrogen and put it back quickly put it back. And then the same thing for the brain. They've shown that estrogen is really important for the brain. So there's just so many benefits, but there's currently only four indications right now. So you have to have hot flashes, night sweats, genital urinary symptoms, or a risk for osteopenia. And then perimenopause just means before menopause. It can start 10 years before. The way I like to think of that is your estrogens runs out like gas in a car, and it can either go put 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 or it could just go bleh, bleh. and so what people are talking about is flooding i've talked to these women have you heard about flooding so menopausal women all of a sudden flooding blood like four to five pads afraid to go in public because they might stain their friend's couch i was like Dang. And I was like is this a one-time thing and they're like oh no it happened like four or five times and i was like this is unacceptable. So like, I suggest making hashtag periods optional when you're going into menopause and then every six months we take you off and we're like, are you there yet? Are you there yet? Or when you hit 52, then you just switch over to the menopausal treatment rather than suffer the indignity and the risk of this flooding or this random bleeding. So if your periods start getting heavy, they start getting weird, that is like indication potential of menopause. If you have any of these symptoms of menopause, there's actually like 34 or maybe 42 different symptoms of menopause, then you might wanna consider going on the pill and just making your hormones flat or patch or ring or hormonal IUD or implant versus up and down, up and down or just random. Yeah, so you said perimenopause is about 10 years before, so it starts in the 40s typically. What advice do you have for people who have a uterus and who currently live in a state that is not one of those liberal states? They don't have safe access to abortion or some states are even trying to get take away birth control apparently. <laughs> I think hopefully we can argue from the scientific point of view that you cannot take away, quote, birth control. It's estrogen progesterone treatment. 70% of people on the birth control pill patch ring hormonal treatment are on it for non-birth control reasons as well. PCOS, endometriosis, anemia, acne, other things like that. And so hopefully we can prevent them from making birth control illegal for those sake, because what am I going to treat PCOS with? I need that. I need that medication to treat it with as a physician. But in those states, make sure everyone knows about the website plancpills.org. So my friend came up with it. She's brilliant. Plan A is your regular birth control. Plan B, though we don't like plan B, we like Ella instead, but cute. Plan B is emergency contraception. And then plan C is O 
My goodness, I am pregnant. I do not want to be pregnant. So Plan C is a nonprofit website. You punch in your state and for every state in the United States, no matter which state, it tells you how you can obtain medication abortion. And there's actually a doctor, Dr. Gompertz in the Netherlands, I believe. She used to take women out on a boat to international waters, perform the abortion because there's no law in international waters, and then take them back. But then medication abortion came and she's like, why am I taking women out on boats when I can just mail you pills in the mail? And so she will write the prescription from the Netherlands. They will ship the drugs from India or some of these sanctuary states, California, New York, to whatever state you are so that no one goes to jail and you can get your medication. And there is a legal warm line and a medical warm line. It's warm line because it's not a hot line because it's not 24 seven, but it's a warm line. They can guide you through this. And if I were traveling to such a state or considering attending college or doing an internship for a couple months, I might get it in my liberal state, bring it with me in my suitcase in case of emergency, in case anything happened. And actually what's crazy, thank you for reminding me, the Supreme Court is looking at a case that may make Mifepristone um, you can't mail it or you can't get it by telemedicine. You have to see a doctor in person or that totally illegal. And even liberal states like California and New York will no longer have access to 50%. There's two drugs you have to use together for the best medication abortion. You could use one of them alone, but it works not as well and it has horrible side effects. So all you're going to do is torture women, which is mean. Why make us suffer, bleed, have cramps? We should just get our business done, get what's my body, my choice, your body, your choice. So we need to all protest the Supreme Court. Do not let them make it illegal to ship it. Do not make them require an in-person visit. Do not make them make this drug illegal. Five million women in the United States have used mifepristone and misoprostol together with no problems whatsoever. It is safer than Viagra. It is safer than Tylenol. To make it illegal is insulting to those of us with uteruses and those of us that care about uteruses. What I love about my feminist dad is he remarked about my necklace that we all came from the womb. No one escapes the womb. Respect the womb. And so respect the womb. I think if they're going to be banning our medication, we should ban Viagra. Yes. Because then they'll be like, oh, no. We should not do that. Yes, yes. No, that always <laughs> irritates me that Viagra is covered in some places and not birth control, not menopause. So you want the 70-year-old dude to get it up, but his wife can't have sex with him. Or you want the 70-year-old dude to be able to impregnate, but you won't give the 20-year-old the ability to prevent that. Yeah. It's absolutely sexist and shows you who holds power in this country, and therefore we need more people with uteruses to run for office run for office and then please support female founded female led women founded women led companies all things being equal and please support your fellow asian american entrepreneurs all right well before i let you go i usually end the interview with rapid fire questions these are one word or one phrase answers you do not have to explain but you can if you want to what's an asian food that you should like but don't kimchi what's an asian food you'll never get tired of shalom pao what is a pet peeve you have as a physician When they Google it and they try to sell it to you and it's like, did you go to medical school? Did you take boards? Do you know microbiology, virology? You think Google knows more than me. And sometimes Google can diagnose stuff, but like, was it a safe source or or TikTok? TikTok's the word. I saw it in TikTok and the chiropractor or the personal trainer said, or the person who's pushing supplements said, Again, did you go to medical school? Have you done the research? Has it been tested in people? And what's a pet peeve you have about the medical industry? I would say insurance companies are evil. Pharmacy benefits managers are evil. We really need to go to universal health care. I absolutely agree with Dr. Paul Song and anyone else who supports universal health care that there's middlemen here and they all need to go. And we need to act in the public's interest, the public health interest. And that doesn't happen when you have an insurance company in the middle trying to make money. For sure. 
And lastly, what's on your bucket list? My bucket list. I would love for Pandia Health. We chose the Greek goddess of healing, light, full moon. I made up the definition so people can remember how to pronounce it and spell it. Pan is every and Dia is day. We want to be with you every day from your first period to your last breath because we're doing birth control, acne, and menopause. I would love to ring that NASDAQ bell. That would be so cool. And then my second one would be to be the first Surgeon General to say masturbation without being asked to resign, which is what Bill Clinton did to Jocelyn Elders, the first African-American Surgeon General. And it wasn't like she was pushing it. They were just like, how do you prevent sexually transmitted infections? And she's like, condoms, abstinence, and masturbation. And because the other side flipped out, somebody had to go under the bus and she had to resign. I was like, Clinton, of what? all people, could have used more masturbation. <laughs> of all people. Wow. Yeah. And so if Not- I were Surgeon General, I would be about comprehensive sex ed. I would be about hashtag periods optional. I would be about menopause and equal treatment, equal research dollars used on those of us with uteri. Because if you don't know, not until I believe 1993 or 97 were they required to have women in research. And even then I would push for as many dollars as you spent on not women, we need to spend on women so we can get up to the same level of research. Yeah, that's something we didn't talk about at all, but sex education. You wanted to share thoughts quickly because I feel like you have a lot you want to talk about (laughs) that we didn't get to talk about. So know that our government has spent a billion dollars on abstinence only sex ed. And I believe in abstinence plus sex ed, born again abstinence. But abstinence only sex ed allows you only to talk about birth control with respect to its failures. And that is not in the best interests of our young people, but birth control plus abstinence. And so my born again abstinence talk is if you didn't enjoy it, then you don't need to do it. And know that in 30 percent of heterosexual encounters, the person with the uterus does not get off. And if you don't get off, why are you risking pregnancy and sexually transmitted infections? So make sure you get yours, ladies, and improve that communication. And know that that guy wants you to get off, too. That's kind of a good person, a good human. You each get yours, right? And then there's a great sex ed curriculum, Health Connected, in California. They're actually the ones that gave me this condom bag. And the example of how cool their curriculum is, is their homework assignment is go ask your parent, what was their first sex? What was that like? And what do they want your <laughs> first sex to be? And I and so there's this book called Not Under My Roof. And so if your young person were to come home and say, ah, uh, my per- my significant other wants to spend the night, the American would be like, not under my roof. The person from I forget if it's Netherlands or Sweden who did that original research, what they are like, okay. And it's not like the person just shows up and spends the night. It's like you expect them to come to dinner, we know them, we get you both on birth control, we get tested for STIs, and this is a loving relationship, and yeah, you spend the night. And when I think about it, I was like, yeah, better under my roof than in front of my house in the car, or in the park, or under the bleachers, or at prom, like, no, you know, you want in a safe environment where no one else can see, where I won't be publicly humiliated. That at the very least should motivate Asian parents to be like, yes, in my house, not on the street where the neighbors can see, right? Or for any parent. (laughs) So um, I'm looking to see if there's anybody with connections in universities. I know that they have an alcohol.edu that they're requiring all undergrads to take, which is a four hour thing. And I'm proposing let's do sex.edu for two to three hours, one hour of Dr. Yen telling you all your birth control options and open Q&A, one hour of consent and making sure everybody gets off and gets theirs, and then another hour of whatever curriculum. So if anybody wants to collaborate on that, please reach out. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. It was really great chatting with you. Thank you you so much for having me here and for your amazing podcast, Making Lives Better for Asian Americans. Thank you so much. Here are my takeaways for today's episode. Number one, if your BMI is over 25 but under 30, plan B is not as effective. If your BMI is over 30, it does not work at all. Ella, which is a prescription one, 
works for BMIs up to 35. But beyond that, your only option is the copper IUD, which by the way, is the safest option of the three. So if you had an oopsie and wanted to prevent the sperm and the egg from hanging out, the copper IUD is your safest bet. Number two, contrary to popular belief, birth control does not affect long-term fertility. In fact, fertility clinics often will put women on the pill to stabilize the hormones before starting fertility treatment. So it will not decrease your chances of having a baby. Number three, from best to worst, the most effective birth control methods are the implant, vasectomy, hormonal IUD, tubal ligation, copper IUD, the shot, the ring, the patch, and then last, the pills. Condoms don't even count at this point. If you're just using condoms, you gotta upgrade, girl. So depending on how definitely you don't want to get pregnant, you might want to consider upgrading to a more effective method if you're still on the pill. Number four, if you're getting an IUD, you deserve pain management. Ask for a cervical block. If your doctor won't give it to you, tell them it's like performing circumcision without pain management and they'll probably let you in. Number five, if you're in your 40s or 50s and you have a uterus, you want to watch out for signs of perimenopause and menopause. Getting on estrogen replacement can help you avoid a lot of complications related to menopause, such as bone density issues, cardiovascular issues, and more. You do not have to suffer through seven years of hot flashes. There are treatments, get them. Number six, historically, women had about eight children on average, which meant that they had about a hundred periods in their lifetime because they don't have periods when they're pregnant and they don't have periods when they're breastfeeding. Today, the average woman has 350 to 400 periods and every time we run the risk of developing ovarian, endometrial, and colon cancer. So making periods optional sounds like a solid plan to me. Number seven, there are about 40 different birth control pills and the one that most doctors are taught to prescribe works better for white women than black and Asian women who tend to have undesirable side effects from them. So if your body is not super happy with your pill, talk to your doctor. Or you can try Pandia Health and Dr. Yen's proprietary matching technology to increase your chances of finding something that works better for you based on your genetics and all of the other stuff. Number eight, umbrella terms like Asian American can be great to build solidarity when it comes to getting our voices heard, when it comes to political power, but when it comes to research and medicine, disaggregating can really help us identify genetic differences in how our bodies respond to different treatments. So that is very important. Number nine, sex education should include more than just how to not get pregnant. We talked about this a little bit, season three, episode 15 with Amanda B. And ladies, you deserve to have fun too. All right, everyone, this is a bit of a long one, but I hope you enjoyed it and found it super helpful. If you did, please, please, please send it to all the people in your life who have a uterus who could benefit from this. If you would like to learn more about Dr. Yen's company or watch her TEDx talk, I will link that in the show notes, which will be up by Tuesday on nuancespod.com. Thank you again so much for continuing to tune in every week and for sending me lovely messages about how much this podcast means to you. If you have a minute, it would really mean a lot if you could go on Apple Podcasts and leave a rating and review there. This would be your gift to me for AANHPI Heritage Month. How about that? But seriously, it would really help more people discover this podcast. Quick reminder that in a few weeks, I'll be premiering this new limited series that will explore quote unquote queerness in pre-modern Asia, which I'm super excited about. So stay tuned for that. I leave you with You Must Have Known My Name by my band 23rd Hour, which is inspired by Mother's Day and Father's Day. Once again, my name is Lazu, and I hope you'll join me next time for another nuanced conversation. You must have known my name before I came along The way you say it sounds just like a song So I'm pretty sure that you already knew my name Before I came along You must have known my name before I came along And when we first walked hand in hand I couldn't reach, I couldn't understand But you were there 
Before this song 